My dearly beloved in Christ, we come today to the end of the year. Today is the last Sunday of the liturgical year. Next Sunday, we turn back to the very beginning of our missals to find the first Sunday of Advent. And so Holy Mother Church, every year on the last Sunday after Pentecost, has us read this gospel from the 24th chapter of St. Matthew, which refers to the end of the world, the end of time. There also is reference in here to the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place 40 years approximately after our Lord said these words. And that is the part, especially when he says that do not go down to take your, go, do not go back to take your cloak. And when you're told to leave, you have to leave immediately. It was revealed to the Bishop of Jerusalem by God, the coming destruction of the city. And so the Christians all fled. They left Jerusalem and were safe in a place of uh, retreat. Now, sometimes it's helpful when we read a particular gospel to read the verses before and after that gospel to get a full picture of what was happening. So today's gospel is a discourse of our Lord that was from the Tuesday of Holy Week. And right before he said these things, he left the temple for the last time. And in fact, he had been disputing with the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the rulers of the people who were constantly trying to trip him up in his words. They were constantly arguing and contradicting him. And finally, our Lord, we might say, had had it. And he came out, if you read the 23rd chapter of St. Matthew, with this very solemn and frightening denunciation of the Pharisees, calling them whited sepulchers, verse after verse after verse, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And he finally ends it with these words, you fill up the measure of your fathers, serpents, brood of vipers, how are you to escape the judgment of hell? And he ends by saying, I say to you, you shall not see me henceforth until you shall, shall say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So those were the final words our Lord spoke in the temple after he'd been teaching there and dealing with this annoying, constant interruptions and, and efforts by the Pharisees to trip him in his words. He solemnly denounced them. And then he's leaving the temple. But then we go into the next chapter, and as he's leaving the temple, this is what it says. And Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came forward to show him the buildings of the temple. But he answered and said to them, Do you see these things? Amen, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So it seems to me that they were trying to, as we might say, cheer him up. He was dealing with this annoyance and constant contradiction from the Pharisees, and he just gave this solemn denunciation. And so the disciples say, Lord, look at all these beautiful buildings, trying to maybe distract him from those negative experiences of dealing with the scribes and Pharisees. And then he said, that not one stone would be left upon another. So then they left the holy city, crossed the brook of Kidron, and went up to the hill opposite, which is the Mount of Olives, where you can look upon the holy city opposite the valley on the other hill. And they came to him and said, Lord, when will these things come to pass? And that is when he said the words that we read in today's gospel. Now again, there are two things our Lord is speaking about. The first 10 to 15 verses deal with the destruction of Jerusalem. But then he talks about the end of the world. The stars will fall from heaven. The sun and the moon will not give their light, etc. The end of time. So fitting, 
on the last day of last Sunday after Pentecost that we reflect upon the end of the world because the liturgical year symbolizes the entire history of the world from the creation of Adam and Eve up until the last day. Now we might wonder, well, why did our Lord give us all of this detail? Because most people will not be alive on the last day. But for those who are, they will see these signs and they will know it is the end of the world. But for us, we must remind ourselves that our end of the world comes on the day we die. And that could come any day. And so as our Lord also said, be you always ready, for you know not when the Son of Man will come for you. But let us reflect for a few minutes on the picture that our Lord paints of the general judgment, where he will come on the clouds of heaven with great power and majesty. Now, we read in the Acts of the Apostles that when our Lord ascended into heaven, there were two men, the apostles were gazing at this vision, and there were two men that stood by them and, say, and said to them, this Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same manner that he has gone into heaven, seated on the clouds, and all men will see him as their judge. We say in the Apostles' Creed, after we say our Lord ascended into heaven, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. The living, meaning those who are alive on the last day, but they will die in the conflagration that will destroy the earth. And the dead, those who had died previously. And all human beings that have ever lived will be gathered together in one place. One tradition is that it will be in the Valley of Josephat, which is that same valley between Jerusalem and Mount Olivet. Although other doctors of the church say, no, that prophecy is to be taken in a figurative sense. But really, how could all human beings, as their bodies are raised from the dead and reunited to their souls, how can they all be gathered together in one place? The simple answer is by the power of Almighty God. Plus, our bodies, when raised from the dead, will no longer be bound by all of the physical laws. So billions upon billions of people all gather together in one place. Our Lord says that the angels will come with a great trumpet and a mighty sound, and it will cause all of those, all of the bodies of those who have ever lived to rise from the dead and be reunited to their souls. But the wicked will look up and will see the judge coming, and they will see the sign of the cross in the sky that sign of contradiction that they did not accept. They did not bear their cross. They rejected it. And they will cry out for the mountains to cover them and hide them from the face of the judge. And our Lord on a number of occasions speaks about the judgment where he will separate the good from the wicked. He will place the good on his right hand and the wicked on his left and the sins of all men will be made known before all mankind, so that it will be seen that God is perfectly just, and that those who are lost, who are condemned to hell, condemned really themselves by the way they lived. They abused their free will knowingly to offend Almighty God, because no one can be sent to hell who did not deserve to be condemned. And all men will be compelled to acknowledge the justice and the mercy, the perfect fairness of Almighty God. And after the judgment, he will say to the, to the blessed, to the elect, to the faithful, Come, blessed of my Father, into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, and to the wicked, depart from me, you cursed ones. It is an amazing, it will be an amazing scene for us to see. And we should reflect upon it as a motive for persevering in living our faith. Now, our Lord also says that the devil is very clever. 
And he will deceive, if possible, even the elect. That is a very important statement in this lengthy discourse of our Lord, that the devil tries to deceive even the elect. Well, who are the elect? All of those who have been given the gift of the true faith. All of us are part of the elect. But we could be deceived. And we must be always humble, realizing that we could be deceived, that we might avoid the deceptions of the devil, that we might humbly pray to our divine Lord, our Blessed Mother, to keep us on the straight and narrow path. And we see that deception. We've lived through it. At the time of Vatican II and the Novus Ordo Mise, all of these Catholics, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Catholics, going along with a new religion. And we see it even today. Just recently, Francis, the so-called Pope, came out with something that is so horrendous, I won't even mention it in church. But it is amazing, and, and it, nothing surprises you anymore. He just comes out with one heresy, one blasphemy after another. And yet there are those apologists for him, those who have the faith, conservatives, you might say, who have remained in the Novus Ordo Church, who will excuse it. They'll come along and say, well, we don't have to accept that because it wasn't infallible or whatever. They come out with some kind of justification. And so we see that the devil is continuing to deceive the elect, to keep people in this new church, which is not the church our Lord founded. So we must be wary and we must be humble. St. Louis Marie de Montfort says something important in his book on true devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. He says, those who adopt this devotion, which is what? It is one of total consecration to Jesus through Mary. Those who adopt this devotion and live it will not be deceived. He says, they might, they might go astray for a short time, but they will recognize their error and repent of it, and they will return to the truth. So the devil will deceive even the elect. And if we're not going to be among those deceived, we have to stay close to our Blessed Mother. We have to practice a strong devotion to our Blessed Mother. Live our holy slavery, our total consecration. And remain again humble and grateful for all that God has given to us. And pray. Pray daily our rosaries, our daily prayers. And pray for the grace to persevere in living our faith. Because again, our end of the world will be when God calls us out of this life. And it could be at any time. When that time does come, may he find us well prepared. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.